to share ideas to help families tackle major issues. I'm your host, Regina DeMeo, and with me today is Chelsea Sonera, who's been with Junior Achievement for seven years now. Thanks so much for being here, Chelsea. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So I have to tell you, I mean, I had, I've just been talking to you a little bit about how I really loved volunteering for Junior Achievement, and I'm very excited to discuss this segment today because I want more people to know about your, your organization. So how long has it been around? Junior Achievement's actually been around since 1919. Wow. It, and it's an international organization. And so many people don't know that. We're in every state in the country and in many countries worldwide. Wow. And uh, what's the mission? The mission is to empower young people to own their economic success. And we break that out into teaching them career preparedness, financial literacy, and entrepreneurship. These are great skills to have. I mean, I can't tell you how many people, you know, when they come to me for a divorce consult have no idea how to manage their own household budget or balance a checkbook. And it's really hard to teach someone at 39 to do that versus like teaching my nine-year-old. Absolutely. So in Montgomery County, how many students do you think participate a year? We serve about 11,000 students in Montgomery County every year. We're hoping to keep growing. A lot of those are public school students. We work with independent schools, private schools, and also non-school groups such as clubs, troops, like Boy Scouts, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts. Yep. Wow. Any group of people where you have kids together with someone to inspire them will work with them. Okay. And my understanding is you come in once at the elementary school level, once in the middle school level, and once at the high school level? Mm -hmm. And we actually have K through 12 programs. So there's a program that's related to every grade level. Uh, there are also programs that students can choose from in, in middle school and high school that, where they can follow just a track that they're interested, such as just entrepreneurship training or just career skills. And oh. within Montgomery County, we do. We serve the majority of our service group as middle school students, and we also do elementary and high school. Okay. So um, I, I taught in third grade. That was, that was my volunteer. Is, do most, do most of the volunteers happen to be parents of the children in their classrooms, or where not do you necessarily. volunteers come from? Yeah, not necessarily. Our volunteers come from, from everywhere. We, just, we look for people who are uh, members of the community who are interested in turning their skills back to the community and making connections with kids. So that, if you're a parent, okay. then that's wonderful. But you don't have to be. You don't have to be. Uh, if you want to teach in your child's school, that's great. If you want to teach in the classroom, that's great. But, you know, every kid and parent relationship is different. So a lot of our folks are corporate volunteers who just want to get involved. We have a ton of parents, too, a ton of retirees, too. That's great. Yeah. I have to tell you, I, I was a little nervous at first. I mean, I don't get nervous a lot, but I was nervous about teaching in my son's class because I wasn't sure how he would react. Mm -hmm. But it, it wound up being an incredible experience because... I think he finally realized, oh my God, other people think my mom is cool, right? It could have gone the other way, I suppose, but luckily the kids really liked me. And the more they warmed up to me, like, he, he saw a different side of me. Yeah, and what's, it, it's interesting that you make that point because the, all of our programs are taught by volunteers. And the reason that that, that that is is because we really feel like a volunteer sends a powerful signal to the kids that there's somebody making an investment in them who actually cares. Right. And they look at that person as a role model, as a mentor, regardless of who that person is. And to allow your son to see you as a mentor, as a role model, is, is very powerful for you. And a lot of people are terrified going in, and it's, it's humorous to us, of course, because we, we do a lot of training uh, to, to get people more comfortable, to make sure they understand the materials that we give them, to make sure they know how to manage their classroom, to know where their supports are. But at the same time, we teach them how to be a powerful leader and how anything that you've done is, is good evidence that you can teach from. All of your experience is valuable as long as you can frame it in a way that kids can understand. And I think it's great that you were able to frame your experience for your son, but also for his peers. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, the training was everything I needed. I mean, the material was all there. I didn't have to come up with anything. Like, I, everything was, was done for me, pretty much. I just had to show up and teach the class. And... I joked with them the first time. I said, you know, I normally am used to teaching law students, right? I, I, I lecture at Georgetown and GW Law, but I've never done nine-year-olds. And they were so sweet. They were just, I mean, full of energy and, and really interesting ideas. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they were following along and participating. It's, it's an amazing experience. I'm, ha I'm really happy you had that experience. And the materials are meant to engage. It's, it's interesting that you say that you lecture because a lot of people's educational experience is lecture. 
Right. You know, you're used to sitting in front of the classroom listening to the teacher, and a lot of cases watching the teacher and thinking about something else. Right. And the JA materials aren't written like that. It's no, they, they really, have to be engaged. They're really, it, they're very engaging. They're yeah. just activity based. So if you can teach a kid how to do a game, then you're in great shape. And if you can make the lessons of that game relevant, then you're even better off. Well, they really got into, we had to, obviously, we, my job was to, the first class was zoning, mm -hmm. having them think about how we zone areas, and then uh, build a city. They love building their own city. They really like that. Um, then we had to manage a restaurant, mm -hmm. which a lot of people got into. They thought that was cool. But they learned about having to price the product and yeah. pay employees. I mean, those are good things to learn. And uh, my favorite was becoming a reporter right, and teaching them because that's very much what I do. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, well, you know, you can read an article on, um, you know, in the paper or online and then think, hey, that would make for a good TV segment and that that's how this industry rolls. And they had so many questions and ideas. It was really neat. That's exciting. The, the program that you taught is called Our City. Okay. And it's, uh, it's our third grade program. And it's, it's really meant to get third graders thinking about the world outside of their group of friends and outside of their household, outside of their community, and to start to get them to realize the skills that they're learning in school mm -hmm. and where they see those skills being implemented in the community by adults. So to get them thinking about the newspaper isn't just something that shows up on my porch, or the internet's not just something that exists for my convenience, or a restaurant isn't just there to serve me, right. you know, what I want. I have to participate, and there are people that put a lot of work into this. So it's really to get them thinking, get them activated, and also to get them looking a little bit more critically at the things that they take for granted every day. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the last segment we did, I think, was on banking. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they, they really, they know a lot more about money than I, I expected them to. Yeah. Yeah, they absolutely do, and they, they know a lot more than we think we knew at their age also, which is, which is always exciting for people. You know, a lot of people say, well, why, they ask junior team in general, why do you start so young? Because we do start in kindergarten, we go all the way right. up to 12th grade, and our opinion is the more connections you can make throughout a child's growing up, the, the better suited that kid is to always be able to see the relevance of the lessons that they're learning. So if we teach banking or if we teach balancing a checkbook, it doesn't matter whether that kid eventually balances a checkbook in the future, but now they understand a skill of right. keeping track of your money in whatever way they choose to do that. And they see the value and they hear it from someone who they respect. So it's, it, I think it's, it's a lot of fun, it's inspiring, and it gets you talking about things that you do every day. Yeah, and I, I think I told you, I mean, I was so excited. My son came home the other day and, uh, you know, he, he didn't come right out and ask for an allowance. He asked me, can I have some chores? Mm -hmm. I said, you want chores? Okay. So I came up with three chores that I thought he could do. And then, uh, you know, I said, why do you want chores? He said, because I want an allowance. And I said, well, you know, how's five bucks a week? And he agreed that was a good price. And so, okay, we're, you know, we're good. But he didn't just come out and say, give me money. Yeah. Right? It's great. You're, you're really, you had a great chance to put his learning and his real life in the context of, of reality for him. I mean, yeah. it's, it's it's really exciting to see him use the skills that he learned. Yeah. And it's great that you guys have that experience together now that you can talk about that. Absolutely. And we really hope that, that you know, we, we understand that not every parent is going to volunteer right. in their child's class. It would be wonderful if they did. Um, but in, in a lot of cases, kids are going to come home with materials saying, I did junior achievement today. And we really hope that parents will take advantage of that to engage their students in that conversation at home, even if they didn't get to have that conversation in the classroom. Right. No, I mean, I really, I wish I could have written a letter to every parent because those, those kids really did warm up to me and share their uh, insights and their, you know, what they, what they like doing. And I went back afterwards for a, like a reading where they each had to do um, their own little books. Mm -hmm. And several of them wanted to read their book to me. It was just so cute. And, I, you know, they're like, look at my artwork. And they really, they just yeah. wanted that feedback from me. And these kids are amazing. And getting some positive feedback at an early age is mm -hmm. just, I think, so important. And it's, it's very interesting for our teachers, too. So when we, when we send a volunteer into the classroom, the, the regular classroom teacher is always there. Right. And that person, as you know, has an enormous job yeah. of getting through so much material amongst other things of doing classroom management, and behavior checks, and testing. Mm -hmm. And to be able, for, from a teacher's perspective, to be able to see someone else interacting with their students about things that are, are important in real life but aren't tests is, right. is very valuable to them. 
And it's a good break for the kids, but it's, it's a, a realistic and useful break for them. So how does the middle school program differ from what I did? Yeah, absolutely. So all of our middle school programs take more of a macroeconomic focus. Okay. So, you know, the kids are, are getting into buying things okay. and having things. They're looking at when they want a car down the road and what their first job might be, and they might be doing some volunteer work themselves. So we really take a look in middle school um, about setting the foundations for some of the big financial decisions they'll have to make in high school to set themselves up for the future. So the middle school program that we run for all of the sixth grade in, in MCPS, and that's the, the bulk of those 11,000 students, is called Economics for Success. And students learn about goal setting. They talk just about their, their general goals, but how to take what they love and think about careers and think about what they want to learn about and think about what they, what they want to do and who they want to be friends with. Um, so they set goals and then they actually get a life scenario. They do a real budget for their house. They talk about their needs and their wants. They learn about cash versus credit. They learn about credit scores and they learn about insurance. So it's, it's You're teaching about credit scores? Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah, and that's the, the it's best. It's important. It's very important and that's where a lot of our volunteers uh, also learn quite a bit. <laughs> Um, it, because, you know, we, we like to think we're providing a, a huge uh, learning opportunity for students, but it's also a tremendous opportunity for our volunteers who might have never really had a formal lesson on things like this to learn it themselves at, at a, a lower level, at a level that they can definitely understand, and then to teach it and master it themselves. So the credit score is great. The kids play a game where they draw cards, and one card will send your credit score really high, and one will send it crashing down. And they just try and see who can have the highest score at the end. And uh, they can do silly things like trade credit scores or force someone else to hand over their card. That's so it's, you know, there's, there's a little bit of, of manipulation of the system, but for a very complex system, they can see some of the, the real life things that can either send you up really quickly or wreak havoc on you. So it's essentially a, uh, a financial planner session with the kids. Do you have a divorce card that says, oh, you're going to get divorced and the <laughs> yeah. whole system will come crashing down? There's, there's nothing that's that, that's Not yet. that harsh on them yet, <laughs> but there is, um, there is one that you co-signed a loan with someone who you desperately loved, and then ah. they left you right. and took the car, and so you just have to pay it. So that's, that, that is that's, you know, yeah. more likely to happen to them than divorce first. But it's the same, you know, the life, same life shocking thing. Yeah. So we do, you know, we do shock them. And, you know, a lot of people will say, this is great, I understand this, this is my career. And then a lot of people will come to us and say, I'm not a financial planner. I, I don't know the real rules behind this, but I've been through it all. And I can certainly talk about it. You know, and as long as you're an adult, you've made some decisions that are pertinent to all of those things. Right. So, so our middle school programs really do focus on, on kind of getting the gist of what it means to be financially literate and mm -hmm. financially empowered. And then when we move on to high school, we have programs that are, that are like that as well. And then we also have programs where students can run their own company, be entrepreneurs, and actually physically be in charge of manufacturing a product, running a board, you know, the whole nine yards of their own company. Uh, we have wow. programs that just teach them success skills. Um, we have programs that focus on economics, on banking. It, it really runs the gamut in high school uh, because kids tend to, to do a lot more digging down into what really interests them. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, the other thing that they need to remember is that at least I, one of the conscious decisions I made in becoming a lawyer is that, you know, I, I knew that was a, at least back in the day, <laughs> it was a, a pretty safe, good career to have. Um, and meanwhile, it was interesting, I was talking to my brother, who's 10 years younger, why he went into TV. And he's like, just because I loved it. I'm like, but you didn't think about the economic consequences? I mean, P TV doesn't really pay that well, unless you're you know, big time and, and actually on camera. And, uh, and it was never a consideration for him. He just did what he loved, which is awesome. Right. But I think that's not really realistic. I think you have to keep in mind, how much am I really going to make being an artist? Right. <laughs> right. And what's interesting is some of those in, in the life scenario game that I mentioned for the sixth grade program, somebody is an artist, somebody's a fast food worker, somebody's a family doctor, somebody's a lawyer. And they really get to see the, the pros and cons of, of having that kind of salary. But when they get to the higher levels of income, they do have to factor in some of their some of their student loans. Right. And you know, several years ago, we didn't hear conversations about 
well, what if I what if I want to go straight into my career? What if I don't want to do college? And now there's a lot more conversation about even the economic viability of college, wow. which is which is great. It's healthy discussion, yep. and all we want is for students to have a realistic view of what they're stepping into, so that when they when they define success for themselves, they understand what it's going to imply. And if you define success as being happy, that's great. But you have to understand what that means for you financially, and that's what they hope we hope they take out of it. We're going to take a short break, and then we will be right back. Hey! So, same time next week? Well, of course. Put away a few bucks, feel like a million bucks. For free tips to help you save, go to Feed the Pig. Welcome back to Making It Last, where we share ideas to help families tackle major issues. I'm your host, Regina DeMeo, and with me today is Chelsea Sonera from Junior Achievement. Thanks so much for being here, Chelsea. Thank you. So I just have to show you, I, I saved this note that the kids gave me after I taught Junior Achievement for five weeks this um, spring, and I have it on my fridge. I don't have anything else on my fridge, but I have this thank you note from all the kids because it was just so sweet. That's really adorable. <laughs> that's, um, you know, that's, that's one, of, one of our favorite things about volunteers finishing classes is that a, a lot of times they get this tremendous gesture mm -hmm. from the students of feedback. And if you think about, you know, you, your own kids and everybody, you know, who has kids knows sometimes getting an expression of emotion out of them is is tough. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we see thank you cards, we see posters, we see kids asking for email addresses, trying to stay in touch. Um, we've had volunteers run into kids at stores and the, the students just say, "That's my favorite teacher ever." And it's just it's a volunteer. Right. And it and it means so much both to the students to see adults as real people and even as peers sometimes. Right. And it means so much to the volunteers to make that connection. And I think this, this note is just a wonderful piece of evidence of that real connection that you made with the students. I mean, it's, like you said, the older you get, I mean, a lot of my friends say somehow I haven't lost that childlike enthusiasm. And my son, when we went to Disney, he said, you know, you you wear your uh, enthusiasm on the outside. Everyone can see that you're excited. He goes, I was just as excited. It was just on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, things like the thank you note from these kids or when you see some of them that still are, you know, showing it on the outside, yeah. it just really, like, raises your own energy level. It really does. And so many, you know, a lot of our volunteers go to middle school, and when they when they talk to me about thinking about middle school students, they think, you know, a, a possibly awkward child or, or a very outgoing child, but a, a kid who's in a very big period of change. Right. Who's not necessarily ready or apt at sharing intense emotion. Right. And one of the great things that we get out of those middle school students, we give them a chance to write down their feelings. So to not share their feelings publicly, which is a challenge sometimes. Right. There's a lot of stress around that, that peer recognition. But some of the notes that come out of, of our students of all ages are just so meaningful. And it's great to know that even though that student might not have shown the most outward display of enthusiasm, that they took something away from it. Right. And that you were able to give that to, to the, the student. And a lot of, a lot of the, the things that our students share with us is, or that our volunteers say rather, is I got to say something to 30 kids that I wish someone had said to me. Right. And that's so powerful. Because... That student might not have ever asked that question to anybody. They might not know to ask that question. And you just answered it for them. Or you opened up a conversation with their parents. So that's, right. that's very powerful. What kind of feedback do you get from the teachers? Sure, from the teachers. Uh, for the teachers, it's a big change. It's a big break for them. They're in the classroom, but they're not, they're, they're not struggling or worried about managing and teaching. So they get to see someone teach, and they get to participate in a conversation and one of the things that, that they enjoy the most is that sometimes teachers share with us that they, they feel a barrier between them and the students. That the students look at them as my teacher who's not a normal person, as just my teacher. But when the teacher starts to share things about their regular life, the kids don't believe it. 
We had a teacher once that ran into to her students at the grocery store, and the kids were shocked that teachers go shopping too, <laughs> that they're real people. Right. And so for teachers to be able to engage in a conversation with a volunteer who's more their peer, right. it really shows their human side and, and lets the students know that the references the teacher's making are, are valuable and relevant to their life as well. But the teachers love it. They, they are very appreciative that we're able to take some time, even if it's time that they would normally spend on their lessons, right. to focus on things that are um, immediately relevant in the real world. And I, I, that's the biggest amount of feedback that we get from them is just that they're happy to see the kids get something that they, they haven't been getting in school for a long time. That's civics, that economics. And you do a survey at the end for the kids sure to do. see um, how they were before they had mm -hmm. the sessions versus afterwards, right? Yeah, absolutely. There's pre and post test data. All of this is up on our website. Uh, we have teacher surveys, we have volunteer surveys, and you can see just a, a ton of feedback, a ton of stats on the success of the program and, and how we measure it. But really, I find that the, the biggest measures of achievement are the, the students' feedback yeah. and the volunteer absolutely. feedback. So, but all of this is done for free because I know that the kids mm -hmm. didn't pay for the packets. I certainly didn't pay for the, the yeah. training material. So how does all of that get funded? Yeah, so all of our, all of our classrooms are run with this enormous briefcase yeah. full of materials. It's worksheets, everything's in color, it's takeaways, there are um, tools for the students to use, even, even rulers for them to take home, right. or erasers, or you know, follow-up pieces that they can use. And all of that, we do provide that at no cost to any party that's participating. And all of that's done through our local fundraising. And it's, it's such a huge element of what we do because right. we say without the volunteers, we couldn't make anything happen. We don't, we don't teach the classes ourselves. Right. But really, it's without the funding, we wouldn't even have the materials to produce to give to the classrooms. And so we have a really wonderful team that, that takes donations and really works very hard to get either corporate funding or individual funding or sponsorships. Uh, to to provide these programs at no cost. And do you do fundraisers? We do. We do fundraisers. We have two really big fundraisers. Okay. Uh, one is the Party for a Cause, which is our bowl-a-thon. Okay. And so uh, it's it's a great corporate event. It's something that uh, a lot of businesses will do kind of as a, a team builder. Uh -huh. But at the same time, it's a great celebration if, after you teach, and a lot of corporations volunteer for us. Uh, but they get together. They put together bowling teams, and it's as if you were doing a walk-a-thon. You raise money for your bowl -a Okay. And that's a, a tremendous fundraiser for us. It's, it's a more informal one. And then we have the other side of the table, which is our very formal Black Tie Gala, which is the Washington Business Hall of Fame. And that takes place in December uh, every year. It's, it's right after Thanksgiving. Okay. Um, and that uh, honors uh, several of the area's top leaders uh, who have made, the most, made great contributions to the community uh, nice. every year. This year it's on December 3rd. Okay. And, and it's in D.C.? And it's in D.C. And that's something that uh, generates a tremendous amount of, of income that goes to providing our programs for us. And these corporate sponsors, um, like, are they consistent? Like they, the same ones every year usually? To some give? degree. Yeah, to some degree. We, we have some big ones. We have a lot of really big supporters that, that come back year after year. And I think the key to it is they, it's great when people write a check, and we love that. But it's great when they know why they're writing the check. Right. So we love it when people volunteer and do the fundraising. And it really, the volunteerism drives the fundraising as well. You know, it's, it, right. it provides a grassroots reason to keep giving and giving at higher levels. Uh, but a lot of them do come back year after year. Uh, the, the volunteerism is also a great team builder. And we do this great training where we yeah. teach people how to speak and how to engage an audience and how to lead workshops. And that's just one of the, the side benefits that corporations see. But they get to put their folks in the classroom doing something that's different, learning from each other, working together outside of the work environment and bonding that way. And so we always hope the folks will get involved with us, individuals, corporations, and that they will do both the teaching side right. and the fundraising side. They're, they're both equally important, and they certainly support each other. I remember when I was doing the training, um, you know, we each had to go around and explain kind of why we were doing this for whatever reason. And also kind of what our recollection was growing up, yeah. right? And it was so interesting. I remember this one woman talking about how she grew up uh, in Ireland and in an all-girls school. Mm -hmm. And really the expectation was, you know, kind of get through high school and then find a husband. 
Right. <laughs> like, they, they really weren't uh, encouraging for any of these girls to get a career. And uh, I was like, oh, my God, I can't imagine growing up that way. And then there was another guy who grew up somewhere in New England in a suburb. And he's like, yeah, I grew up with all, uh, all white kids. We were all the same, same socioeconomic class, and that's how I grew up. And so the teaching here is going to be kind of interesting because I understand that, you know, this is a very um, cosmopolitan area, and there's people from all over in different languages. And then it got to me, and I was like, wow, well, I grew up in New York City. <laughs> and, um, you know, we had every single nationality you can think of. And actually, English is not even my first language. English is my second language. And uh, they were all looking at me like <laughs> I'm like some weird person, which probably I am. But it was just funny how we all came from these very different backgrounds. Yeah. And I learned a lot from those other volunteers. And it, that's, that's one of the great things we do in the, the training program, is that we get people to explore what their assumptions are. Right. Because a lot of where you teach from comes from your assumptions. Right. You don't want to tell a student, definitely get a mortgage, if a mortgage is going to completely wreck that student's life. Right. And then it's also very instructional for our volunteers to go into a classroom in this very diverse area mm -hmm. and to have to think about the assumptions that their students have. Right. Because that gives them a very interesting... Uh, way to look at their peers as well. You know, when you step into the classroom, you'll be looking at students and working with students who come from unbanked societies, right? right? So if you talk to them about the value of it, they might be hearing a completely different story at home, neither of which is right or wrong. But it, for you as an individual, as an adult, to explore how they held those values and where they come from is, is extremely a valuable takeaway for the adults too. Yeah. But it's great exposure for the kids. So it, it's mutually beneficial. And, you know, sitting in that training room, I know a lot of our volunteers have the light bulb turned on over their head thinking, wow, I never thought about that. And that's really just the beginning. Because if you never thought about it, imagine the kids. Well, I just never realized how lucky I was until I heard some of these stories. I was like, wow, no one ever assumed I was just going to, you know, finish high school and then get married, get married. Right? And I never grew up with just one type of individual like it, we were all so different and different interests and different backgrounds and, yeah yeah and that's just the melting pot around here too right. of course that there are so many people from so many different backgrounds that we have to even have that discussion right. it's certainly not true in all the areas of the country no so if uh, someone wanted to volunteer do you do trainings throughout the whole year or is now the best time to get started it, we do we do them throughout the year it's a okay. great time to get started because we we essentially block out a calendar for all of our schools for the whole year okay so if someone wants to get involved at a specific school or a specific time of year now's the time to really take a look at that calendar and have their choice Got it. and we hope that people will volunteer once and come back so getting involved in the fall is really the way to go okay but we do the trainings once a week once every other week um, we do them in our offices, which are in Gaithersburg. Okay. We also have an office in D.C. in Fairfax where we do the exact same training. And folks can choose whichever location is more convenient to them. The training takes about 90 minutes. Uh, but the best way to get in touch is just to give us a call or uh, go onto the website. We have a volunteer registration form. And we have great staff that reaches out and talks about what a particular volunteer's goals are. Okay. And what's the website? The website is www.myja.org. Okay. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the best place. You'll find all of our information on there. Including the fundraiser? Including the fundraiser. Okay. And you can see all pictures of these great fundraisers, people having fun, and pictures of people in the classroom, too, uh, which I think people are, people are worried. They're a little scared of, of getting in the classroom. It makes people nervous yeah. to present. But, you know, you see pictures and you always see smiles at them. So. Yeah. No, we we do hope everybody goes to the website and checks that out. Well, thanks so much for being here today. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Well, thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you next week on Making It Last.